Good morning, Southside. Special welcome to anyone who's visiting with us. We're grateful to have anyone come and be a part of our family and worship the living God. So we pray that uh, you will see his glory and majesty and you will be blessed in your time with us this morning. I uh, wanted to make a special announcement. I with laryngitis last week. I skipped all my announcements, so I'm going to make up for it. <clears throat> um, a dear family in our church, uh, Tim Walker and his wife, Evelyn, uh, who's, his family is the Headleys, and there's not, probably not a soul in here who hasn't met Ed Headley. To know him is to love him. Uh, well, Tim went off to the Expositor Seminary, and that brother has labored faithful. He gave up a business. He, so he has seven kids, guys. It's growing. Seven? Up? Eight? Keep going? Nine? I, don't, I can't remember. The, ten? Eleven? One more, and it'd be Israel. That's beautiful. <laughs> so this brother took his whole family and went to, to study at this seminary, uh, and he just graduated uh, last week. And so I just want us to be in prayer for him and his family as God leads and guides them in the weeks and months ahead and, and direction and, and all of those things. So hallelujah. Praise God for his faithfulness uh, to, to Tim and his family. Um, another announcement I wanted to make, I want you to be praying for some special young ladies uh, in our church. Mariah Steffens, is she here? She is. Mariah, can you just stand up? You don't have to come up. Uh, and she's not here. Who said that? Oh, that's the other one. Stand up, Muffy. So Catherine Einspar, um, you can sit down now. Thank you. Um, these two faithful ladies have been called by God. He's been calling them and they've been following that for, for years now to go. They want to go serve uh, Africa, different areas of the world, uh, working with orphans, medical, and they're linking up with Sim. And I was going out there to spend time with Sim, who I, I really love this organization. They, they want to work with the church. They, they understand a high view of the church and, and working together and sending out your missionaries. And I got sick and wasn't able to go, but uh, got a great report. And we will keep sharing with you what's going on with those two ladies. But I, I want you to really be praying for them during this season as they are preparing and getting ready to serve God in these areas. So, well, I'm excited. If you'll open to Romans 13, 11 through 14, we are looking at pure gold. And unfortunately, it's going to take two weeks. Uh, it's just so rich. Um, there, there, there's a rich history of this passage, really, in the history of the church. And if you'll remember back when we began Romans, we, we came to Romans 1.17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And we looked at how Martin Luther was converted by that verse, born again, and the Reformation sprung from that. The German bowl was set on fire by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it just spread through Europe. <laughs> this morning, we find ourselves in really another one of those texts. In November 13, 354 AD, Aurelius, Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. I had my expert uh, check that, that pronounce, it's, it's Augustine. It's Augustine, not Augustine. I've said it wrong for a lot of years, so that's a big deal. Uh, he's, he was from North Africa. He had two parents, most people do. Um, <laughs> One, his dad was a complete pagan, and his mom was a very devout Christian. And his mom, Monica, prayed daily that her son would be converted. And his father desired that his son would get a superior education, and he would just become very wealthy. And he was trained at Carthage. He, he was very gifted at rhetoric, and he excelled, and he became a professor in that art. And as a young man, he sought everything that the world had to offer. He was very promiscuous, foolish. He left his godly mother. And he, but he, he did write this, Thou hast formed us, God, for thyself, and the heart is restless till it finds its rest in thee. And this is where he learned it. He, he was so restless trying to satisfy that void in his heart, and he was chasing everything in the world, and it just kept leaving him more restless. 
Augustine had an incredible desire for philosophical truth, and he became very famous. Uh, he became a professor at the University of Milan. It launched him into this rich and famous society. And as he entered into that, he began to say, it, it didn't satisfy, it left me empty. And through all of this, he said he believed in God, he just was not a Christian. And then he finally came under the influence of Ambrose, who was the bishop of Milan. And this man was a great godly preacher, genius, and he began sitting under that man's ministry. And Augustine just, Augustine just went to hear his homiletical style because he was just so into that kind of arts understanding, and he just wanted to hear him. And, and as he sat under it, he got a deeper and deeper understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet he said he did not commit himself to Christ, but he began reading his Bible. And he just, he, he loved his sin too deeply to let go of it, he said. And one day he was with a close friend and they were reading the Bible because they both had become so distressed of soul. And he finally just pulled away from his friend and he retreated by himself so he could just weep before God. And I want you to hear what he penned. <coughs> he said, I flung myself down. How I know not. I was under a certain fig tree giving free course to my tears. And not indeed in these words, yet to this effect spake I much uh, unto thee. But thou, O Lord, how long, how long, Lord, will you be angry with me forever? O remember not against us former iniquities, for I felt that I was enthralled by them. Why not now? Why is there not this hour an end to my uncleanness? And I was saying these things and weeping in the most bitter condition of my heart, when lo, I heard the voice of a boy or a girl, I don't know which, coming from a neighboring house, chanting and off repeating, take up and read, take up and read. And immediately my countenance was changed, and I began most earnestly to consider whether it was usual for children in any kind of game to sing such words, nor could I remember ever hearing anything of the like." So restraining the torrent of my tears, I rose up, interpreting it no other way than as a command to me from heaven to open up the book and to read the first chapter that I would open up to. So quickly I returned to the place where his friend Olypius was sitting, and for there I had put down the volume of the apostles when I rose thence. I grasped, opened, and in silence I read that paragraph on which my eyes first fell not in rioting and drunkenness, not in clamoring and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. No further would I read or did I need, for instantly as the sentence ended by a light as it were, security infused into my heart and all the gloom of doubt vanished away at that moment." Praise be to God. He said it was there that my restless heart found rest in God. It was there that he found a greater pleasure than all the things that he had been chasing in this world. Later, he became the Bishop of Hippo, and he served there for more than 40 years, and he died at 76 years of age. One man said he's the greatest theologian between Paul and Martin Luther. Verse 13 of Romans 13 that we will look at today, uh, what he was, and verse 14 is what he became as he put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's my prayer that God would use this passage with great power upon this congregation. As I have found in my own study, I believe this to be the right message for the right people at the right time. May God awaken our sleepy souls. This is a call to the church of God to wake up, understanding the time and the day that we live in, and to quit sleepwalking, and to wake up to the beauties and the glories and the excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you. Romans 13, 11. Do this knowing the time, that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night's almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, 
Let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Let's pray. Father, use these words. Holy Spirit, take the truth of these words and wake us up. Let us know the time. Let us be awake to the time that you have called us and the season that we're in. Wake us from our sleepiness, our drowsiness, our meandering through life. God, America has made us numb. Church is soft, sleeping. God, let that not be true of any heart here this morning or live streaming. God, wake us up. Do what no human being can do. Make us awake. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we begin, as always, expository preaching is try to follow the author's thought and intent and the arguments that he's making. And so my biggest question as we begin this text is how do what we studied the last two, two weeks, Romans 13, 8 through 10, uh, the fulfillment of the whole law to love your neighbor as yourself, the law of Christ, how does that now tie in to what I just read? What, what's the <coughs> connection? And the grammar in verse 11 demands that there is a connection. So it, it just... I'm not barking up a tree, I shouldn't. There is a connection. It says, do this. And besides this, the best translation, and this, and this. Uh, verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And this, and this. I, I went back to see how Paul used this in uh, 1 Corinthians 6.6. 6, he says, brother goes to law with brother. They're going to court. And this before unbelievers. So you're looking at, in light of that, they're going to court and this, they're, they're going before unbelievers to hear their, their trials, their problems, their court cases. Philippians 1.28, don't be alarmed by your opponents. It's a sign of destruction for them as they persecute you, but of salvation for you and this from God. So understanding that you're going to be persecuted and they're going to come at you and this is from God. He's the one bringing it. So, and this is picking up what is being said in verses 8 through 10. And, and, and it means that as we move forward in the next two weeks, it shows that Paul's logic is taking the full force of the law of Christ, all that he's been teaching us, and he's moving it forward to how it impacts the imperative that he is now going to give to us. It's a powerful imperative. So, there's a connection. What is it? You have this connection then of verses 8 through 10 of love. And then we're going to move into chapter 14 on these conscience issues. And Paul's going to say the big issue is that you love God and you love others as you make these decisions. And so you just have all this love going on. And in between it is this strong exhortation in verses 11 through 14. One commentator said verses 11 through 14 is the linchpin of this whole section. This is what holds it all together. So what I think is going on here, I, I, I always use sandwich illustrations, I'm sorry. I love sandwiches and it's just this love sandwich. There, there's, there's the fulfillment of the whole law is one slice of bread. It's all been fulfilled in Christ. Love fulfills it. And then we're going to look at how we love with our consciences and our, our differences, and they're just going to come together. And so um, the, the bread, if you'll look with me in verse 1, therefore I urge you to offer up your bodies by the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. So this exhortation is going to come out of the past mercies that God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And Paul has said, when you look at his mercies, you offer up your body a living sacrifice to him. And then in verses 11 through 14, here is how you're to live in light of the fact that he's coming. He's coming. And for believers with blessings beyond what you can understand. And so the crux, guys, if you want to be holy, 
If you want to fulfill the, the law of Christ, here it is. This is what takes duty and turns it into delight. This is it. It takes the law and it puts it in your heart. It's not out there. It's in here. This is what makes his commandments not burdensome. This is it, is that he gave you all the mercies in Jesus Christ. He's coming again to make all things new and bless you for all of eternity. That's the bread. That's what's going on. Those promises are yours. And they're yea and amen in Christ. And that is the foundation of holiness. That's what's going to cause you to fulfill the law and love God and love other people. Those two truths. Listen to how Paul said it in Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, the first coming, bringing salvation to all men. What did it do? It instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteous, and godly in this present age. Sounds like the verses we're looking at this morning. And as we do it, he says, looking to the blessed hope of the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These two comings or to purify a people who are zealous for good deeds. That's the foundation for holiness. And Paul has a tie in here that I want you to catch back in verse 11. So, and this, knowing the time, knowing the time, the, the time that we live in this morning, there's something about the time that we sit in that calls for love, laying down your life for others, seeking God, all of these things, that this time demands it. All that we've seen in Romans 12 through 13 is a death to self. It's lay your life down for others in love. That's, that's been the, the general principle through all of Romans. In an age that he's going to call darkness, this age is in darkness, and this age lives with a self-focus. Everything's about self, self-worship, self-pursuit. That's the darkness. And these two are polar opposites, the darkness and the light. The dark night and the light of day that he's going to contrast are complete opposites. And we will apply them deeply into our lives uh, for the response of the two comings of Christ. So as we begin this morning, I just want you to know, do you know the time? What time is it? Is it driving you to love? Who said 11.15? Send them out. <laughs> that's everything I'm going to try to argue against. But that's all right. So is this time driving you to fulfill the royal law of Christ? Or are you just self-focused, self-seeking, pulled back the time? Let's take a look at it. Here's our outline this morning. We're going to look at wake up. Next week, we're going to look that we're to put off the clothes and what we were when we lived in darkness. And he wants us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the armor of light. So wake up, put off, and put on. It's very simple, but profound. So come with me to wake up. Verse 11, do this knowing the time that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. <clears throat> so this do, loving God and loving others, being about the kingdom, do this because you know the time. And the whole argument hangs on us knowing that. We are to know this. Do we know what time it is? I want you to do this the next time, whoever that funny guy was, that someone says, what time is it? I just want you to answer hey, it's the time in between Christ's first coming and his second coming, and he, it's close, and we're on the eve of him coming back. That's what time it is, and they'll never ask you again. <laughs> what time is it? I'll tell you what time it is. We are to know the time. As believers, we understand the time. We comprehend it. Knowing the time made Paul's heart burn for Jesus Christ and other people. Knowing this time doesn't make you sleepy. It wakes you up. It revives you. Knowing the time made Paul's heart just on fire. 
This Greek word for time, there's two words, chronos, where we get the word chronology. And it's how you measure the passing of time moment by moment, second by second, a calendar kind of thing. But there's another Greek word, that's the one he chose here, and it's kairos. And that means time with a purpose, a specific moment in time with a very special significance. It's an epic-making period that has been foreordained by God. Do you know that time? Something historical is anything that just happens in space and time. I got up, I brushed my teeth. So here it is. But it's historic when, let's say, it's Pearl Harbor, and it's called the day that will live forever. And so it happens in history, but it has a huge impact on history. So knowing the time is this is an epic-making period. And what we are living in this morning in God's plan of redemptive history is a call to understand the times that you live in in relation to Jesus Christ. So do you understand what time you're living in? Ephesians says, He has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him Christ with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. And that is the summing up of all things in Christ the things in the heaven and the things upon the earth. So the call here is to realize and know the significance of the time that you are living in. And this is a special time. It's an epic. And the Christian is to know this and to be alert and awake to it. So our view of time and history is what sets the Christian apart. You are different than anyone else on this earth because they just look at Kronos. It's all just day, time. How do I fill my time? How do I get enough of this world? How do I grab the gusto? Everything is just that. The unbeliever looks at life by the wars that have taken place, the, the cycles of nations that have risen and fall. But the believer looks at time by the unfolding of the mysteries of God. The time element of this history must be seen in relation to Jesus. The world is before Christ and after. And so we see history as this, guys. The time before he came, the time when he came into it, and the time when he comes back into it again. That's how we look at history. So Paul says, know the time. The time right now is between the two comings of the Son of God. This is the interval between what he has done and what he will do in consummation and f summing all things up in himself. So we are living in the last section of time. This is the last period in the history of the world. In the, this is what I call the over overlap in this sinful age and the coming of the age of righteousness that could break forth this morning. So that there's this little overlap. Um, we're right now, we're mortal but we're eternal. We're justified before God this morning, but we're sinners. We're seated in the heavenly places, but we're being squeezed on every side by afflictions. We live in the already of what Jesus has done and the not yet of what he will do. We're on the eve of the return of Christ. And when he comes, time will be no more. There'll be no more time as we know it. There'll be no more time to seek the Lord Jesus Christ and no more time to fulfill the law of Christ. When he returns, time is finished as we have known it our whole lives. So Christ came into the world and his return is imminent. And all of God's plan and purpose and his promise of the return of his son is that he's gonna make all things new. And what I love about this is it's not negative. It's not sitting around grumbling about the time. This is positive. He's saying we live in an, an incredible just around the corner time. You live on the, on the eve of his return. This, this, is, this is incredible. It's to wake you up. Some of you are so drowsy, I feel like I got to come shake you. <laughs> Father, wake us up. It's time to wake up. This is so big. The kingdom has come without obliterating the old age. He has entered in and he has brought salvation. His, his kingdom has begun with him in invisible lordship now down here on earth. And he didn't obliterate the, whole, the old age. It's still alive and in darkness and well. 
But we have fulfillment right now in Jesus Christ without the consummation. We're waiting for his return. We're waiting for that consummation when he does destroy all of this evil age. So we live in the overlap. That is, that's the time that we live in just waiting for his return. This understanding of time should help you like nothing else in your journey and in your life. Mark 1.15, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In Thessalonians, Paul says, now as to the times of the epics, brethren, you don't have need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves are know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And while we're saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child. Unfortunately, some of you know that pretty well lately. We've had a lot of babies born, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. You're not in darkness, guys, that the day when Christ comes back should overtake you like a thief. You're not in darkness. You shouldn't be living into this darkness and taken off guard when he comes back. For, for you're all sons of the light. You're sons of the day. It's broken in. We are not of the night of darkness. We live in the world of darkness, but light has shone into our minds and showed us the glory of God in the face of Christ. So then let us not sleep as others do. Don't be sleepy like everybody else who hasn't had the light shine in. But let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. That's when all their sin and all that they do takes place. They get drunk and, and get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's being alive, awake. For God has not destined us for wrath but for the obtaining of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what we're studying in Romans 13. And so my burden is I'm afraid that we just don't know what time it is. I don't think you know what time it is. We live and we act like this is not the time that we live in. Christianity has become, how do I get more of this world and hope, peace, and prosperity? We're, sleep we're sleepy. Guys, there's no more shadows and types. The reality has come. The blessed hope is now before us of the return of Christ. No more work on this earth until he comes back. And we're meandering. And we're sleepy. And we're drowsy Americans living in darkness and night. So by the Holy Spirit of God, I ask you, do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? In our verse, he says, it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. And this has such implications for Americans who live in Disneyland and Vanity Fair. It's time to wake up is what he's saying. It's an interesting word for sleep. In 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul used the word sleep, it was that they're dead. You know, that they're, they're sleeping and it's talking about death. But he uses a different word here, hypnos, where we get the word hypnosis. And it meant deep sleep, groggy, in a daze. Every one of you should preach up here one time to see that that might describe 25% of us. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm awake because I'm standing up. I do have compassion. Just sleepy. Wake up. I call it COVID saints. There's just been a grogginess for the last three years. And it's come and it's left us frustrated and just sleepy. We're just sleeping. Do you know what time it is? It's not time to be sleeping. I'll tell you one thing I've learned in my journey. You know, you know what I call a, a sleeping pill? Pornography. And anyone I've ever counseled in that are so sleepy. It rocks you to sleep. Gaming all night, it rocks you to sleep. This is not the time to be asleep. This is the time to be awake. The alarm clock went off. 
It has been sounding since the, the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, just going beep, 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 wake up. Do you know the time that you live in? I don't want to say which kid, but I had a kid who that alarm clock went off for an hour every day. I think she had five alarm clocks. <laughs> One that shook the bed. I think Brian preached on this. I just feel like the alarm clock's going off. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and we're sleeping. Beep, beep. <gasps> we're in the end times. This is it. Christ ushered in the last times. History peaked on Calvary's tree. The linchpin of history was when he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. In my, into your hands I commit my spirit, Father. This is the end of time. It began ticking. And, and Paul's just, after all these beautiful things he's been showing us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he just says, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. What about these truths are making you sleepy? This is not the time to sleep, to be inactive, self-preoccupied, lethargic, unengaged, sitting on the bench, shooting darts at people. That is not the season that we're in. Engage. Wake up. Mankind is sleepwalkers. They're zombies. They're just walking around unaware of their lost condition and peril. And as you look at that, you go, no, they, they just seem so alive. They're, they're movers and shakers. And, and you look at them and you're like, wow, look at them. And they're just dead. They're sleepwalking and they're walking around just living it up in this world, laughing, making jokes, drinking it up, maybe persecuting you. But God, death, judgment, and salvation, they're just sleeping. They know nothing of it. I was watching the Nuggets play, and man, they won finally. I've been watching for 50 years. And <laughs> in LA, and there's every movie star sitting around the court, and I'm just like, sleepers, you're all asleep to what really matters. God, he's, he's coming to this world to save sinners. He's coming back. And he's going to make all things new and he's going to throw down sinners into eternal wrath. And he's going to bring the others into eternal blessing forever. That's what you need to be awake to. These things, like we, we can't be awake to our, our movies and then sleep in church on Sundays. We are... Those who are awake because of the mercies of God in Christ Jesus, you offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. I'm awake. God, take my members and use them for your name's sake, to love other people. Here it is. We want to give God an offering because of his mercies. Our lives are to be a life of love. Oh, no man anything but to love. The day is to awaken us to agape. How does it awaken us? Have you ever tried to wake someone up who doesn't want to be waking up? That's my spiritual gift. <laughs> and they ain't getting up. You, I've drug them out of bed. I've tickled their feet. You can, I mean, you can do everything and they just won't wake up. And you can stand up here and plead and beg and show them the mercies of God. And you're just like, wake up. Wake up. He's come. And he's brought salvation and he's coming again. Do you know the time? For now, he says, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. How do I wake him up? Salvation's nearer than when we believe. When Christ ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God, there was this, I'm going to call it an hourglass, so to speak, and it was turned upside down. And his return is, is every day, sand is going through it, and nobody knows when it runs out. And when it runs out is the return. So how much time before he's going to go from invisible authority and lordship to visible where he comes back? And when is he going to come as, a, as a, a lion and not a lamb? That time, Paul says, is nearer than when you first believed. It is nearer today than when you first believed. And so if 2,000 years ago is nearer, what is today? No one but God knows when this last season of history of the world will end. All I can tell you is it's nearer than it's ever been. Does that do something for you? It's nearer than it's ever been. Wake up. Wake up. 
This is not the time to be sleeping. It's time to be like Nehemiah where he had a sword in one hand and a shovel in the other. One life will soon be passed, but only what's done for Christ will last. Spend it on the right things by knowing the time. And so I I just beg all of you in every area of your life that you would wake up. Wake up. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For salvation is nearer than when you first believed. And my question is, I, I've already been saved. What's he talking about? Salvation is near. Or that we, there's three aspects for those who have never gone through this part. When you believed, you were justified. You were saved. And before God, you are accepted. You're not guilty. Your sins have been paid for. You're wrapped in his righteousness. You are justified. You are saved. And then the gospel is now God puts his Holy Spirit in you and gives his holy word and his holy church to begin to be being saved. He's now changing us from one image of glory to the next. Every one of you who are a believer, you're being saved. And trials and everything that God's going to bring, you're being saved. And in our text this morning is there's a day that you will be saved. And that's when he comes back and makes all things new. The devil's thrown down. Sin is taken away. Glory, hallelujah, forever. That's what he's talking about. That day, that salvation is nearer than when you first believed. So with that in view, Paul says, live lives with your hands outstretched toward this. Groan for it. Oh, come, hasten it. Come, Lord Jesus, finish the work, consummate it today. Grown. Philippians 1 6, he who began a good work will complete it. That's this. He's going to complete it. He's going to finish it. He's gonna, you're going to be saved. 1 Peter said, This salvation is ready to be revealed. Romans 5 9 through 11, that's salvation. This salvation is near, and it's nearer to you than when you first believed. And so you will be saved to sin no more. You won't wrestle with the sin, the devil, the world. You'll have no ignorance of God, no wanderings, no disaffections. You will be lost in love, wonder, and praise for all of eternity. Guys, you will see Jesus. Be awake. You're going to see Jesus. Wake up. Wake up. If the present mercies of God are this sweet, I've been studying for 35 years since I got saved, and they just get better and better and better what are these new mercies going to be like? What will be coming with Christ? I think it's nearer than when I first believed. I want you to hear that. And then he gives one other encouragement as well. The night is almost gone and the day is near. These things are uh, smelling salts. They're to wake you up. It's nearer than when you first believed. The night's almost gone and the day is near. So again, we're back on this overlap of the time we live in. When Christ came into this world, uh, the sunrise from on high, Isaiah said, will visit us. It will break in. And the light came into the world and it says the darkness could not comprehend it. So this this system, this world, it's in so much darkness, it couldn't get Jesus. It couldn't comprehend it. And so the whole world lies in darkness and evil. And, and we're all born into our own internal darkness. So it's this dark world, this dark day, and we come in with just an internal darkness that can't see the glory of God in the face of Christ. We, we fit this world system perfect because it's dark and we're dark. But the gospel, these beams of light break in. And every one of you should have that testimony that it broke in. And your dungeon flamed with light and your chains fell off, and your heart was free, and I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That light broke into your dark minds. So it's not on the outside, it broke into the inside, and that's why you're just such a peculiar people that you see, you see, you get it. And now you live in the overlap between the day and the night, Darkness is night. And Paul's saying this season of the world and darkness is almost 
over and they run around boasting and they have parades about their immoralities and you just look at it and I just want you to hear this this morning, it is almost done. They're boasting the political stuff we see. This realm is almost done. It's almost over. And there's another reality that's about to break in and it's going to swallow it up. Lightness dispels the darkness and it's going to be like the noonday sun. The glory of Christ is going to just emanate. And so it's no longer just in my mind now, in my heart, it's going to be in the whole world where we'll no longer need a sun because the glory of Christ will light it up. So hear that. Man's day is almost over. Doesn't that bless you? I like it. Yeah. Thank you. I should get you excited. You're awake. This is a good day. So man's day is almost over. Christ's day is so soon. And he's going to appear in all his glory. And the rays of his returning glory will break. And it'll be Christ's day to be marveled and worshipped and glorified. The day when you'll be conformed to his image. So hear this. It is almost gone. The Greek word means to make progress or be nearly over. The, the night is almost done. And the day is at hand. The return of Christ, the day that is so often pointed to in Scripture uh, as the day, that day, the great day. I'm just going to read you a couple verses. I have like 20, but we're not going to do them all. <laughs> Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me, on that day. And this is going to be that final judgment. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Jesus said in Matthew 24 or 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Third, Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10, when he, he's going to come to be glorified in his saints on that day. Timothy, this reason I suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed for I know who I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Hebrews is to encourage one another all the more as you see that day drawing near. Peter, so we have this prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises. Thessalonians, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. You don't live in darkness. You have the light broke in, and the next week he's going to say, so quit living like you're in darkness. You're done. Light has broke in. You, you know better. You can see through it. God's given you eyes to see quit living in the darkness. The day's almost here. And to draw near and be at hand, I see it peeking up from the horizon. And he's going to make everything new. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And for the night to be gone and the day to come, the verb tenses are interesting. The night almost gone is an aorist, and it's like a snapshot. The night is almost gone. Just this whole season is almost finished. But the day is at hand is in the perfect tense. And it means that it's going to happen with an abiding result, like throwing a rock in a pond with all the ripples. And when he comes back, the ripples are going to be unbelievable. You're going to enjoy it and drink it up for all of eternity. It's at hand. That's what's coming. Give you butterflies. It's almost gone. The world of sin and all of its consequences, what is coming on that day is unfathomable. And we see it in a mirror dimly, but enough, I see it enough to wake up, put off my deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And we will look at that next week. So our imminent Christ-likeness is that salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. And, and our imminent Christ that day is going to come upon us. And every time it's talked about, Scripture says it ought to make you holy. It ought to wake you up and make you holy. Set apart for God. Romans 12.1, offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. Moral slumber in light of the time and the great drama of redemption that we live in is incompatible. The time is almost over. All of history has been pointing to and standing ready 
The bridegroom is about to come for his bride and make her filled with bliss eternally. And then there's somebody sleeping in the corner. God, wake up. Next week, he's going to say, therefore, therefore, in light of this, this is what we're to do. I remember, this might be a dumb illustration, but I'm going to do it anyways. No, nah, never mind. Um, so in closing, two questions. I think the first one is, do, do you know what time it is? I want you to get along with God this week. Do you know what time it is? Am I awake? Or am I just a drowsy American Christian meandering like the, the, the ten virgins when Christ comes back and five are ready and five aren't? And then the last question I have for you, how does knowing the time produce love? Because that's the connection. And I, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot. And I think for me in this way, my hope isn't this world. It, it's not what's around the corner. It's on that noonday sun breaking forth. That's what my hope is built on. And instead of trying to build my world here, I'm trying to build that kingdom that will last forever. And so my family isn't my chief priority. That isn't, it's, it's under that big goal, my portfolio. I don't have to have that house and that car. I'm free because what's coming? That's my hope. That's what I'm looking for. This train is bound for glory. Don't take nothing but the righteous and holy. I'm looking for that. I want to I wanna then give my life away in love. I, I mentioned those two girls at the beginning. Who, who wants to just give up everything and go work in an orphanage in Africa? Who wants to do that? Who wants to give up watching TV tonight to go help a brother that needs to move? See, the, it just starts to come in as it, it's supposed to to produce love when you're not trying to build your kingdom here. Here we have no lasting city. Go outside the gates and suffer with Christ. That's what this is telling us to do. Give my life away in love until the one who has taken my heart away comes back for his bride. Come. May that hope of the second coming of Christ set you free in a million different ways this morning. And you might be sitting here going... Pastor, I have the most difficult spouse who ever lived. And all I can tell you is you keep loving her because he's coming back. And you're, you're going to have a beautiful, beautiful bridegroom for all of eternity. And some of you have just, I'm thinking of some of these health battles that I counsel. It goes on and on and on and on. And I just want you to hear, it's almost done. It's almost done. And What's coming is going to be amazing. Those who have never even been loved by your own parents, what's coming is unbelievable. And so I just, all I want you to do is take every trial that you're holding to this morning and just, this is the answer. This is, he never promised to make Denver paradise. Never. And if you're going to try to build your kingdom here, you're always going to be frustrated. You're never going to have assurance. You're always going to be discouraged. And he's just saying, know the time, wake up and give yourself in self-sacrificial love to anyone and everyone until he calls you home. Let's pray. Father, powerful words. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to pen him. And I pray now by this truth and by your Holy Spirit, wake us up. Would they write about the great awakening of 2023 at Southside Bible Church when the Spirit blew through and just woke us up to what's real? Woke us up to, to the coming of Christ and losing our lives and self sacrificing love till the one who gave his life for us and modeled it returns for his bride. God, wake us up. There's just so much lethargy in our midst and sleepiness, and self-centeredness. Let the mercies of God in Christ Jesus and the second coming of Christ wake us up. Wake us up to love. 
God, I pray, break through, set people free, do something mighty in our midst for your name's sake. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. All God's people said, amen.